Is the cat? Is the cat? The cat here? is in frame. Yeah. Oh, now, oh yes, yes. I'm trying. Hello, cat. How did I get it all the way over there? I put it over here just so I could do this. The cat. And look what happened. You know, like this is supposed to. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. I really need it today. This is going to be a long one. Ugh. Oh man. You brought a lot of notes. You brought a lot of. <laughs> this is almost more text than the book itself. This is your like you're defending your PhD. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, sorry, Kitty. He doesn't seem to care. Yeah, he's leaving. That's it. Oh, hello. Anyway, if you haven't watched part one of Jay's journal, you should go back and do that now. For background. Because... Should we wait? Yeah. We'll wait. All right. Welcome back. It was great. I've got too much to talk about to do that here. All right. Also, I got Sparks Rare Keys to Happiness self-help book, which he published in 1967. And... It's a sprawling hot mess. Is this a picture of her? Uh, I. It might be. It might be. She. All the pictures of her that I looked up, and this is perfect. Mm -hmm. Have her in diamonds and furs, and you know, too much hair, too much hairspray, and yeah, the, like she's a nouveau riche. What they used to call nouveau riche. The, like the, she's married into money. Here the, she just scammed the, into money. The price tag on the front is three dollars too high. Was Can you it read that? Two ninety nine. No. Oh, a dollar fifty. That's right. That's right. You pay me a dollar fifty to take it. Anyway, I, I, um, I guess I'm a masochist because I read all of this. So. Going over some of that today. Uh, I honestly don't think Deseret Books, the uh, the publisher, actually, in here I misspelled it as the Punisher. Oh, the, hey, well, that's uh, actually more accurate. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's a. Uh, you know, did anything other than run the presses on this one. With every page, I can't decide whether I want to be shocked or offended. Now we already established All right. that claiming "Go Ask Alice" was written by anyone other than Sparks is utterly absurd, right? Right. right. You mean, but of course that it was e even taken from a diary or that she right. spoke to a child. She just completely made it up. But while reading *Keys to Happiness*, I ran across something that sparked my memory. Let us compare. In *Go Ask Alice*, I quote: uh, "I read once that a person is lucky to have." Two good teachers who stimulate and motivate him in his whole lifetime. Okay. This, this is an unusual fact. I've never heard that before. She made it up. That's why you never heard so it. So in Keys to Happiness, we find the following. Surveys have shown that a person is lucky if they have two really good teachers in their whole lifetime. <laughs> now, I wonder where she got that. Now, I could show additional striking similarities. Mm -hmm. But unlike Sparks, I know that repetition doesn't actually move a narrative along. No, really. She doesn't understand this. Chapter 29, Keys to Happiness, the opening paragraph. It may seem like I am repeating myself on some of these points. She's repeating Alice. Is it? She's repeating it. No, it's Keys to Happiness. Yeah. She's actually claiming to be herself. But it is like the old minister who said, when I want to really impress something on my flock, I first tell them what I'm going to tell them. Then I actually, I'm not even going to finish that quote. Fuck it. Skip to the next paragraph. Do you know that's an old vaudeville comedian's rule? Yeah, I know. I know. I, I do. I, that's why I don't have to do it. Yeah. We all know what's coming in there. Yeah. All right. Uh, next paragraph. Somet sometimes when things are retold in different ways or methods, they are more impressive. No, they are not. That's not how writing works. Page one done. Excuse me. I know that I'm only on page one, but I need a break already. That's right. You need a drink and a cigarette. I haven't had one of these in years. Oh, what, what is it? You're, I was going to have like a rock star. But <laughs> rip a mate instead. It'd wake you up. Yeah, seriously. Send one, send, we should send a coupon to the audience, too, so that they can wake up at home. All right. Speaking of break, there's breaking news about Jay's Journal Part 1. Well, not really. Mm. It's more like an addendum, because when it comes to research, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. So, this is a Family Achievement Institute addendum. We're going to briefly revisit BS's, which is her initials, actually. <laughs> Scam with Norman Vincent Peale, the multi-level marketing scheme known as a Family Achievement Institute. That's right. She did have a, a pyramid scheme that she ran with Norman Vincent Peale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I call my dog uh, Egypt because he lives in a pyramid in every room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got him. Um, I, I, what is that? That's, that's a 2% joke? <laughs> is it, okay. 
Uh, you see, I left the name out of part one because after a brief scan, the guy seemed upstanding and innocent, and my story was about how they were all a bunch of psychotic scammers. I thought, well, this guy won't help my narrative. <laughs> There's often some truly good people roped in with the wrong crowds, right? Not this time. I've seen that. <laughs> Everyone who's ever worked with Sparks in any capacity is guaranteed to be a monster with blood on their hands. Our final name is Bob Richards, a pastor and Olympic sportsman. The young Billie Jean King was part of his congregation, and she said he helped influence her to become a great tennis player. Uh, he, he helped influence her to become a lesbian. Probably. Yeah, yeah she's, I, was, I was into guys until I met him. Uh, Richard closes out the last track on the introductory record titled Being the Person. So what kind of person is he? Well, in 1984, he ran for president under the Populist Party. His running mate that year was a woman. Very progressive. Oh, time, yes. Right? Very nice. The running mate, Marine Kennedy Solomon, was president of the National Health Federation. Sounds uh, reasonable, but... That's reasonable. Yeah. It's important to note that, like Beatrice Sparks, Marine was an uncredentialed, dangerous fraud for her proclaimed field as well. <laughs> Perfect. You see, the National Health Federation is a lobbying group that promotes anti-vaccination, homeopathy, and other non-verifiable, oh, non-reproducible medical claims which don't hold up to scrutiny. Even then, she was an anti-vaxxer? Even then, before it was cool, she was an anti-vaxxer. She was an anti-vaxxer. They... Now, this is during the polio era. This is during the... In 84. The, oh, oh, okay. It was still, we're still... Uh, I think I had polio when I was like you know, a child. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 84? She was an anti-vaxxer? Mm-hmm. Well, anti-vaxxing started in the late 70s. Oh, I didn't, I didn't yeah. realize. It wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't hear of those people till... Uh, I thought it had to do with the early 80s when Reagan let all the lunatics out of the asylums. <laughs> <laughs> when he defunded yeah, the first all paper, the paper, I think went out in like seventy. I'd have to yeah. look it up, but it's like seventy seven. When he defunded all the federal mental institutions and gave it to the states without money, and they had to let everyone out on well, the yeah, streets, they ha- they, I thought that was connected well, with the rise of anti. No, no, that's because they needed somebody to run for uh, in oh. the midterms. Oh, know. okay, yeah, okay. Um, they are one of the groups responsible for carving out homeopathic remedies in a way so they do not have to undergo the same rigor trials or copious documentation as actual medicine. They don't have to be demonstrated to be effective, nor do they have to be inspected and are exempt from good manufacturing practice requirements. Because they don't call themselves medicine. As a result, many homeopathic remedies have had contamination poisoning piles of people. Sometimes it's not even contamination. As a product itself, it's just actual poison. (laughs) For instance, a common homeopathic formula, which is offered by multiple manufacturers as pain relief for teething infants, contains belladonna. Oh, also known as toxic, deadly nightshade. Usually the cream is so diluted well, that it's just pure sugar water. But occasionally actual ingredients slip in and kill a baby or two. Well, it, they, it quiets them down. Eh, eggs, meat, omelet. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, yeah, the cream doesn't actually work. Uh, anyway. Oh, on top of it, <laughs> it doesn't work. We can, I mean, <laughs> we, we can thank the National House Federation for the carve-outs that allow these things to look like actual medicines and be placed on a shelf at your drugstore next to things which have to follow actual laws and can't just be tubes of diluted poison. Yeah. The good news, good news here, is that like many of the fake doctors who promote phony cancer cures, the VP candidate Marine eventually died from a perfectly curable cancer yeah. because she relied on the nonsense instead of actual medicine. Well, at Hooray! least she, she walked the walk, though, so she <laughs> believed it. Yeah, she did. Oh, that's she, surprising. She I thought she was just like Norman Vincent Peale yeah. and Beatrice Sparks, or just a grifter. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize she she was a devotee. True day. believer. Yeah. But we've gotten really off topic. Oh, that surprises me. I didn't realize, I didn't see that twist coming. Yeah, really off topic. <laughs> we were supposed to talk about Bob Richards and his run for president in 1984 under the Populist Party. Using the slogan, America first, that's never problematic. No, no. <laughs> that's never been a problem. Let's try to understand what the Populist Party stood for. Do you know who they ran for president in 1988? Populist Party. The Populist Party in 1988, yeah. is it going to be like Pat Robertson or no, something like no. that? David Duke. David Duke. The America's the favorite neo-Nazi. He, the, the actual Anti-Semitic former... Anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist, convicted felon, and former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That's right. The party was founded by two other Klansmen, one from Jackson, Mississippi, and one from Torrance, California. <laughs> Southern California Local loves boy. pumping out Nazis. <laughs> But something doesn't add up. Is this really the all-American Bob Richards? The first athlete on the front of a Wheaties box? A white nationalist? Debunked race science? A white 
why is that word there? Sorry, I, I can go to this. A white nationalist race science toting crank? Mm. Was he always like this? Let's quote him from a 1968 Sports Illustrated article. Billy, I've been doing some... Oh, I'm going to get up and do it. All right. Billy, I've been doing some eugenics exercises, okay. which have made me strong. And plus that, I have my Sietua this morning, which is weedy spelled backwards. <laughs> <laughs> witty, witty. Yes, that's right. He felt that the word he had to hide in that sentence was not eugenics, but the name of the cereal. <laughs> what a guy. Probably because they didn't want to have anything to do with him. That might have had something to do with it. No, eugenics is, right? Yeah. Just making sure. Art Linklater, Nomer, Vincent Pierre, Pat Boone, Bob Richards, and Peter Sparks. That's a nice crew. All right, now into the topic of the day. JJ, the king of journals. I'm JJ, the king of journals. Part two. Uh, this has been broken up into sections. I am going to hand the paper to you and have you read the headlines to introduce them. Deal. Okay. Read the big text. B train wrecks over her train wreck. Part one. In most books, there's a few pages before the content. Introductions forward, some brief ceremonial nonsense that most people can skip because it's usually empty fathom, right? Yeah. Not here. <laughs> These three pages are Sparks' defense of why the next 250 pages of what is clearly transparent nonsense is actually real. Here she is. First two sentences <laughs> of the book. At 7 a.m., January 3rd, 1978, a very distressed mother phone. She said she had read an article about how I had prepared Go Ask Alice from an existing diary and voices, not then yet released for personal interviews. Hmm. Alden's mother didn't call. She wrote her a letter, actually. Hmm. It wasn't in 1978. It was in 1973. After that, Beatrice takes the opportunity to plug her to other books. So she lies at... Page, page word one, two. word one, yeah. <laughs> All right. Skipping ahead, she defends her screed. Hoping to fill in sketchy gaps. <laughs> in Jay's journal, I interviewed many of his friends and teachers. As a whole, they said he was mostly just like everyone else. Three kids who had been into the occult with him seemed more skittish. As long as we were talking about school, dating, family, drugs, hobbies, or sports, they were relaxed and friendly. But when I tried to question them about witchcraft, they changed, became frightened, secretive, withdrawn. Uh, through bits and pieces, I gathered that they were under some strange kind of sacrifice my own life or have it taken from me type of programming. They sincerely seemed to fear that I could bring harm upon myself or my kids if more information was di di uh, diverged to me. Their obvious and object terror was contagiously and hauntingly real. So wait. She interviewed three uncooperative kids that refused to talk and threatened her with violence. But somehow, they were her primary sources right. for the supernatural cult parts of the material. They, two people that didn't want to talk, so much so that they, they threatened her, as you said, with violence. But that's, that's where she got all the information That's from. where she got the information. So she says they don't want to talk, but then she uses them as, as their... Uh, it's interesting to note that Sparks was so incompetent at changing the names and places uh, of everyone familiar with the story could immediately had uncovered the real names of the real people involved. So everybody yeah. that was familiar with the death was like, oh, this is about, I know yeah. who these people are. But things like the three anonymous sources who somehow refused to tell her anything and also told her everything have never come forward. That's right. And I wonder if, because like, they don't exist. like her PhD, it doesn't exist. Like her college degrees <laughs> in their entirety, they don't exist. I wonder what she was like. Was <laughs> she like, well, two people is not enough. You know, so, let me make up a third many. one. Yeah. Well, let's just say it was three. Let me make, yeah. make up three people. Whatever. And they all had the same act. All of them were uncooperative. All of them threatened her with violence. And none of them have come forward. <laughs> She, yeah, it's, and she doesn't even describe him. Like, she didn't even come up with three people, one of whom was more cooperative, and he called them, and then he talked the other one into something. Uh, no more it's details. Just, they all have the same thing. She she wasn't going to rock rack her brain to come up with three separate characters. So uh, let's get into it. Last right. time we talked about how roughly 95% of this text is not from the Rio J Journal and comes from Bee's imagination, her all-night bingers in front mm -hmm. of the Olivetti. Yeah. Here's your job. Okay. Re read the part. Captain, we've, we've hit a... No, read the... Oh, part two. Captain, we've hit a number. Mm-hmm. And go ask Alice. Alice was 15 for 24 months, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> B doesn't make the same mistake here, but she does make other ones. J, at the age of 16 and a half, after getting a car, supposedly enters high school as a freshman. Well, that would have been two years ago, two years prior. All right. Now, when I was 16 and a half, I was in 11th grade. Yeah. Here she puts him at 9th grade, meaning he'd technically, technically be 21 when he graduated high school. It's very interesting progression for a gifted child. Yes, especially. Yeah. He uh, got, as they say, left back. Now, I, I'm twice. thinking maybe Sparks was held back three years and was just thinking of her own childhood. Who knows? <laughs> or since she didn't graduate high school at all, <laughs> she has no memory of it. Let's see. I was out of sixth grade at, at 15, so <laughs> 16 is ninth grade. <laughs> Sparks has a bad habit of repeatedly citing events that happened af well after Jay died. <laughs> yeah. I honestly don't think she was even trying after a while, and even name drop statistics from 1975 and 1976. Jay once again died in 1971. <laughs> mm. There's no editor or fact checker or anything. They just typeset this thing and printed copies. Simon and Schuster? No, it was, it was, it was uh, Times. Uh, Times book did it. Uh, the New York Times book? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It gets crazier. Let me read the passage. Yeah. All right. He went to a but Bhutan ceremony two years ago. In fact, he quoted John Welsh, some kind of biggie in the National Cattlemen's Association, who said that in 1975 and 1976, there were about 3,000 cattle mutilations. So there's three things here. Bhutan, John Welsh, 3,000 mutilations in 1975 and 1976. Mm. As far as I can tell. The only use of Bhutan literature or the inter on the internet is as a 19th century spelling of Bhutan. So I believe it's made up entirely for this yeah. book. I, I checked what, so many what things. What is she saying it is? It's some kind of uh, cattle mutilation ceremony. But I, I checked... And no one can... Like engrams, Google Books, uh, you know, ProQuest. I, I checked as many yeah. things as I could, you know. I have books on the occult and, you know, I... I I can find it. As for the rest, John Welsh should misspell it in the text. Mm. After that correction, you will find that he was an economist mm. for the lobbying group in the 1970s. However, there's no evidence that we reported on cattle mutilation numbers. The Cattlemen's Association's primary occupation was with legislation. So where does this association of the numbers and the Cattlemen's Association come from? I think uh, this is the source. Of, of, of where that book. nonsense. Yeah, I, I don't think that she took it from anywhere and then put it in here. She made it up. I think she made, I think she. And, and hoped that it would spread elsewhere and then it would be able to be documented she, yeah, she, post the publication. She did enough of her research book. to find a name with the Academy's Association that was legit. Yeah. And then she kind of just made up some numbers and put it in there. Um, the 3000 number is made up. Uh, the real number that was reported at the time was around 900. And John Welch never got in front of any microphones. That would have been a spokesman, mm. not an economist. Yeah. So if there was like a TV special, let's say, and they interviewed somebody from there, yeah. they wouldn't have done the economist. They would have, you know, it, somebody would there's somebody be assigned a, to do that. Uh, a it's a lobbying group, yeah. right? So they have like they specialized have people. They are people. Exactly, yeah. right? The claim doesn't appear in any newspaper, LexisNexis, any magazine, in, in, in the LDS archives. I was thinking that maybe John Welsh is a member of the Mormon church and she knew him personally or, you know, because they have uh, biographies and obituaries for all these people, and he's not there. Um, so Sparks could have done a bit of research, found the name, and then just stuck it in there. Um, other things were easier to find. Uh, she, she cites an American Journal of Psychiatry article, uh, which was published in 1977. Mm. And there's a fair amount of indirect evidence that most of the text was written in 1977, as opposed to the six years between receiving the diary and publishing it. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. For instance, in 1977, uh, Leonard Nimoy hosted a show that ran for five seasons called In Search Of. Yes, I remember it. It was about supernatural and paranormal mysteries. Mm. The crossover between Jay's Journal and Season 1 include the May 22nd, 1977 episode about Atlantis, the May 28th episode about supposedly learning and teaching ESP, and the July 26th episode about voodoo. Many of the details match. So I think she was just watching television. And yeah. just put in her book. But There's, also after he died, Jay. Jay had been yeah, of course. at this point dead of, for six years. And, and, and she, he was still watching TV. And she TV. was sitting on the journal yeah. 
for a number of years yeah. until in 1977 she's like, well, I might as well do something with this. Yeah, and then... Mm -hmm. There's other sensationalist trash from the era, which has thematic similarities to Jay's journal, such as the 1975 Peter Fonda movie, Race with the Devil, about people trying to escape a satanic cult after witnessing a murder. As an aside, the Satanists in that movie write using the same invented alphabet, invented alphabet that the Zodiac Killer used. <laughs> right. Pretty fine. Oh, I wonder if Beatrice Sparks was the Z Zodiac Killer. <laughs> this is the first connection here. The Zodiac Killer was, what, 78? No, no, no. He was in the 60s, oh. 70s. Something like that. Oh. We, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those right ones about where, her peak uh, time yeah, flying never, around. They never unnoticed. quite found the, the person, so they don't yeah. really know. You know, the, the only one that really sort of super came forward was Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. And he, you know, when he was caught, he was like, well, I, I, I have to, I'm going to turn myself in. Like, I just yeah. did all of it. Because he, was, he had a mental problem, right? He yeah. Said, Here are the people that are killed, and here's what happened, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he just laid it all out. Yeah. But most of them, you know, they tried to claim, I killed 5,000 people, or whatever right. it is, right? Right. Anyway. Part three, all the madness of Jonestown without the party favors. Most texts will square the so-called satanic panic in the 1980s, right? That is when things became truly bizarre. For instance, uh, just one funny one. In 1982, there was an awful made-for-TV movie with a 25-year-old Tom Hanks called Mazes and Monsters, based on the nerd game of Dungeons and & Dragons being a gateway drug to actual supernatural magic <laughs> and, and ritualistic murder. Now, before you say, who'd ever watch that? The thing was on CBS, so the answer is nobody. Yeah. Your grandma. Oh, he'd like to dig at CBS. Um, but let's go back. The real panic started from the ultra-religious, the Pentecostal and the LDS. They formed a revolutionary vanguard in the 1970s to what later became the truly unhinged psychosis we call the 1980s. For instance, in 1972, an evangelist from San Bernardino, California, published a book called The Satan Seller. In it, he fraudulently recalls sexual orgies and drug dealing, his rise in the ranks of Satanism to the high level of high priestess, <laughs> presiding over satanic rituals, including magical spells, summoning demons, ritual sex, including a kidnap and rape, and how he escaped a murder attempt. Yes, a copy of that is in the mail. Don't worry, it's coming. <laughs> okay. I have it on order. Uh, the evangelicals have their own closed media loop, and there's a number of totally madhouse hysterics by shrill pastors, saber-rattling imminent doom, starting right around the time of the Civil Rights Bill, actually. Yeah. I'm sure those are completely unrelated. <laughs> Let me give you their basic worldview. All right. In fact, let's just quote the book. Brad and Dell and I have all done crummy, mean, little, rotten things all through our lives, but we aren't second-class rejects retards. I love my family, my home, God, my country, Dad, Chad, and Kendall, Mom, and Apple Pie. <laughs> Functionally, they observe a binary grouping of everything. This is why you see them a group together opposing political groups simply because they are not the ones they personally identify with. Essentially, there's a uh, one way to live and everything else is a fall from grace and thus intimately related with each other and come from a giant lump together. Of course, the world is more complicated than a childhood fa fairy tale, but try telling them that. Um, their level of discipline in the ideology is how they measure their value. This is the orthodox people, yes. right? Uh, things have to be saw shoved into their rigid orthodoxy prior to being accepted. They oppose everything that hasn't, haven't successfully been sold, believing they're all de demonic encroachments. That's the only way to sell it to them. The hysterical refusal to voluntarily incorporate new patterns into their worldview can be summed up in one phrase. Uh, I, I need to buy it. Oh, wait, I need a Bryant. Okay. <laughs> One of the casualties of this inability to perceive things beyond their nose is the psychoneurotic Anita Bryant, Boy, America's favorite singer. Bats, batshit crazy. She joined Bob Hope in his performances for the troops. She even performed the halftime show at Super Bowl V in 1971 mm. and at Andrew Johnson's funeral. She also linked the struggle for LGBT people to have rights to visit a partner, say, dying from AIDS in a hospital to homosexual grooming and child molestation. <laughs> She linked it to child molestation. She was uh, possibly the most evil uh, member of the 70s. Now, before you say <laughs> these things are unrelated, let's have her defend herself. All right, all right. As a mother, I know that homosexuals cannot biologically reproduce children. Actually, that's like kind of as a human, right? I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. think you need to be a mother for that. Yeah. Therefore, they must recruit our children. Recruit. If gays are granted rights, mm -hmm. next 
who have to give rights to prostitutes and to people who sleep with dogs. Wow, who, who thought of that billing? So prostitutes have no rights at all, right? And, no rights. And, you know, some people, some, some people are dog people. You know? Yeah. Here's all lumping together. <laughs> Since two women in a physical relationship is beyond Anita Bryant's nose, that makes it utterly indistinguishable from other lifestyle yeah. deviations or crime. Now, for what it's worth, there were real events that permitted those so inclined to stitch together paranoid fantasies of how a more liberated society is somehow opening up the gates of revivalist Christian hell. And to be perfectly honest, books like the Satanic Bible mm -hmm. by California-based Anton Levin in 1969 certainly didn't help the cause. Um, nor did the Zodiac Killer, who drove around Northern California looking for isolated people to murder in the late 1960s. Or Macaray Edwards, who kidnapped and slaughtered children in 1950s and 60s. And Obviously related to... was finally <laughs> caught when three abused girls escaped from his California home in 1970. Then, of course, there's Charles Manson, who had his famous doomsday call of homicide in that run-down ranch outside of San Francisco, California, and was convicted in 1971. And Juan Corona, who slayed 25 farm workers and left them in shallow graves outside of Yuba City, California in 1971. Later in the decade, you have Jim Jones from San Francisco, California, the Hillside Strangler from Southern California, and Ted Bundy from San Diego, California. But now we're getting ahead of ourselves. And let's not forget the sexually assaulted and brainwashed 19-year-old heiress Patty Hearst, who was kidnapped from Berkeley, California, by the Symbionese Liberation Army, who also did some assassinations, bank robberies, because apparently that is simply what one did if they lived in California in the 1970s. So she's she's linking these together based on the uh, moving away from the um, Bible. But at the same time, there was the popularity of Anita Bryant. So I link it to the popularity of Anita Bryant, cause people to drive around California killing people. Now. That was a four-paragraph setup to a good punchline. Oh, okay. I hope you appreciated it. <laughs> I'll work hard on that one. All right. Anyway, hmm. there were lots of movies that leveraged this opening of the Gates of Hell narrative, hmm. such as the 1976 movie Carrie, filmed in California. Wow. Well. And the 1973 movie The Exorcist, filmed in Washington, D.C. And the 1976 film The Omen, filmed in London. How did we leave California? I don't know. Hold on. We aren't even supposed to be there. Let's get back to what was... Covering your face. <laughs> Let's get back to what was likely a constantly breaking Smith Corona sitting in Provo, Utah. That's right. <laughs> Let's Part six, writing level no, three it's to not five six. years. Part four. Oh yeah, do your finger. Part four, writing level three to five years. Right. You see, reading level. This is writing level. Apparently aware of the criticisms mm -hmm. of her unusual vocabulary, go ask Alice. Jay's journal is truly absent any sophisticated verbiage. This is interesting, since the journal in question is ostensibly authored by a teenage genius. Oh, God. Right. I don't know if I'm going to get through all of this. There's a long tradition in literature of lazy writers wrapping characters in comically primitive stereotypes to make them look distinct. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the 17th and 18th century, English literature, when someone is talking, starting to quote a German, will change the font to something called Fraktur. In the 19th and 20th century, foreigners and black people were given comical accents by... Uh, by misspelling the letters to try to, emu uh, by like, misspelling the letters. Yeah. Okay. I don't read all this one. For instance, Mark Twain gave his black character a samba like Southern draw. But to be fair, most of his white characters were depicted as banjo playing slack jawed yuck yucks. Uh, these serve as loud, obnoxious cues for the reader, like if a saccharine violin plays in the background during a tragic se scene on screen. It's almost as if the director barged into your living room and slapped you in the face and said, This is the sad part. You better cry now. It's ridiculous and pathetic. So, of course, Sparks did it. She feels an obligation to frequently remind the reader that the author is supposedly an adolescent. She does this by making hackneyed grammatical mistakes that read like the oval-shaped comic strip of Family Circus or <laughs> the Annals of Prairie Home Companion Radio Hour. Oh, sorry, that show was more like eight hours. Um, Ingo S. Gallus, her phony advice column from the book, a Jay's Journal, and uh, her phony advice column from the comic book, mm. Jay's Journal, and Keys to Happiness, she does the same techniques to try to persuade us that it isn't just her imagination playing the role of a child, but we are reading the actual writings of a child. To me, she's equally ineffective in our pursuits. There's a love B has of naming people in a list with ands instead of using a commas. She also swaps me and I frequently, mm. uh, repeats simple adjectives, and uh, crass exaggerated emotions. 
taking together, here's how to write like these sparks. I made this one up, but this okay. is me and Billy and Jimmy and mom went to the soda shop. It was very, very, very fun. At the soda shop, me and mom had a banana split. Jim also had a banana split. It was the best day of my whole life. That doesn't sound like a brilliant teenager. That sounds like a first grader. In this style, Sparks essentially takes a grammatical pat pattern of children under about five yeah. and attributes them to teenagers. Her characters talk this way about drugged orgies and murdering people. <laughs> it's just profoundly unbelievable. Uh, this laughably inaccurate depiction of how teenagers talk doesn't only expose Sparks as a hack writer, but also a fraud child counselor. She obviously has extremely little exposure to how teenage writers speak. Mm. Otherwise, she would find this just as laughable as we do. Yeah. Part five. Now I understand why they make books flammable. Mm -hmm. In the comic sci-fi novel, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Vogon aliens have a unique form of, t of torture. They believe themselves to be talented poets, but in truth, they are so bad that in the text, it acts as psychological torture. Alden, the real Jay, was a budding poet. Most of the poetry in the text is pretty terrible. Again, if we are going to go on a premise that all of the terrible text is by Sparks, let's see where that takes us. Now, I apologize in advance. I'm going to read some poetry, okay? L oh. Life is so dull, so worthless, and so small, until you call. Then rays of sunshine fill my soul, and I am whole. Now, I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. This is absolutely necessary. I must do another. I'm sorry. Dolly G, I'm glad I'm me. There's no one else I'd rather be. I smile on every bird and tree. Life is a ball. I'm in love with me. And the music is great, too. Yes, two and three supposedly rhyme. Listen, I'm just reading the text in front of me. Now, let's mix it up. Uh, I have something here. So. Pop quiz. Okay. Here's your thing. There it is. All right. Uh, so I'm going to read four more. I'm so sorry. I'm so very sorry. Uh, two are by J and two are from B. Let's see if you can find out which is which. Please get out something to write your answers down. This will count towards your final grade. Okay. Right. Poem one. Dick spit and hit the teacher in the eye. Dick split and so did I. Didn't want to see the teacher cry. Poem two. How sad that life and growth are based on tears, and blind are left to lead the blind, or fall behind to depths of despair that have no ending anywhere. Poem three. That last one wasn't bad. Anyway, let's go on. Oh, sleep, why do you wander like a sheep that's lost? And in my time of deepest dark and need of thee cannot be found. Come sleep and soothe my furrow head. Come sleep and rest with me upon my bed. Please sleep. Come rescue me. Poem four. See Jane run. See Dick run. Jane does not try to run fast. See Dick catch Jane. See what Dick does to Jane. No, you are too little to see. That is only for Dick and Jane and me. Here are my answers. <sighs> no. I disagree. <laughs> I say it's BJJB. Oh, because I thought she was purposely trying to be bad. That's why I'm thinking JBJB. Okay, and what are the answers? We don't know. Oh, we don't know. We don't know. I, I, I say that um, Alden was a suicidal teenager while B was a sexually repressed psychotic moron. Yeah. So, you know, there right. are. So there's. He's probably smarter. Well, not only that, but there's things in here which are which are clearly like sleep deprivation, yeah. or you know, I feel detached from the world, and there's other things that are like, I'm so horny, I want to fuck everything, you know. And then they're like, okay, right. well, I think I know which one's which, right? Yeah. Because okay. like he killed himself, right? So, I am going to disagree with you now. Th th that's why I should keep everything under control. I think. Anyway. Um, let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, anyway, speaking of sexual repression. Here we are. We have another one. Part six. Excited in all the wrong ways. Okay. Again, B deals with childhood sexuality in completely inappropriate ways. It reads more like soft course sexual erotica involving children. In Jay's journal, this woman of the Lord has a section entitled Joys of the Trio. When we were in Boy Scouts, the patrol we organized 
was called the Boner Boys Patrol, referring to erections, of course. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> this may sound perverted, but we were indeed quite horny. Ruining a nice organization such as the Boy Scouts of America was quite an accomplishment, even though we weren't trying to do anything but be ourselves. After this sentence in the book, the writing style changes, and the sophistication of it seems to become substantially better. I'm going to move on, and you'll see that this is dramatically different from the first part, so the next paragraph. Anti-values were for establishing our own peer group. Now, realization that violence leads to oppression. In order to unsystematize the system, you must work from within the system, and you must be open to different points of view. In order to become a legend, all the same, and we will yet be legends, even if we all are, even if we, even as we are apart. All right. That's the garbled mess uh, of interplaying and unrefined ideas that you find in young people that are trying to think deeply about the world, right? Uh, oppose this to the Boner Patrol. The, the sections that be added to these entries serve unsophisticated and sophomoric uh, purposes. Uh, it's because life is a messy stream of events and experiences, and it's not a narrative, right? Stories are constructions of these raw materials of life. It's the task of a documentarian is to take these pieces, include as much of them in as rich a manner as possible, and form a cohesive narrative around them. That's what you're supposed to do as a nonfiction writer, right? Jay's journal is an entirely invented narrative where the events and experiences of Alden's real diary simply act as the environment in which they happen. It would be like uh, reading Anne Frank's diary and saying, oh, this is cute. Let's write a story about a little German girl growing up in Holland. She can have a dog named Fifi, a favorite bakery where she gets a shroop waffle. Maybe go uh, not get along with a girl at school. It'll be great. Actual entries in Anne's journal wouldn't push... Actual entries in Jay's journal when it puts the narrative along because it wasn't constructed to support the events and experiences. Only to use the most simplistic superficiality, there's absolutely no conceptual understanding of the underlying mechanics, right? It, it just simply sets the scene. Yeah. Similarly, uh, the text by Alden can't put Spark's story forward because her story wasn't built around it. So when she includes the actual text, it's obvious because it's adjacent to the rest of the narrative. And the parts she does decide to include, one can only assume are for equally absurd superficial reasons because she essentially lacks a cognitive capacity to go any deeper. So in this section I just read, uh, the word that sticks out to me is the word legend. The egotistical confidence of Sparks oozes through the text. There's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, okay, wait a second. <laughs> what? I can't, I can't. Where's it going? I'll be right back. Now, this is not going to get done. I got 20 minutes, and somehow I've got seven more pages. Um, I thought I could get through all of this, but especially when he leaves, like, this just is not happening. Maybe I should just continue to read, and then maybe he will, like, um, you know. What is going on? Like, th this is terrible. Like, you know. I also have a script. I, I have something here that he's supposed to be reading. In fact, I'm just going to go on. Screw it. Uh, and the part she does <laughs> decide to include, one can only assume they are there for equally absurd superficial reasons because she essentially lacks a cognitive capacity to go any deeper. So it is. Oh, yeah, I just read that. Not only are they unable to perceive the accurate concepts, but uh, they're also unable to comprehend that they are incorrect. The Dunning-Kruger effect is about statistical anomaly. Mm, come on. Okay. Let's try this one again. See, this is, this is, why, this is why life sucks. Um, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect is about the statistical anomaly that those who seem to perform the worst on some objective questions consider themselves the smartest, cleverest, most well-informed, and deepest thinkers. Not only are they unable to perceive the accurate concepts, but they're also unable to comprehend that they are incorrect. Take, for instance, the parents who killed their babies with the phony homeopathic poisons, or the woman who died from curable cancer because she refused valid medical treatment. Grasping of concepts to get them past their own ignorance is beyond the capacity. They end up killing their loved ones, and sometimes themselves, because they're unable to and uh, do the mental lifting. Did I miss anything? Um, back to Sparks. I believe she was thinking, I am writing this utterly believable text that's going to fool everybody. Here's a journal entry that uses the word legend in it. I find it quite humorous that people do not realize I am writing a legend, a work of fiction. So I'm going to hide it in here 
just like it hid the reference to the prodigal son narrative in Goes Gallus, and I'm sure nobody caught on to that one. Also, Sparks is a big fan of working within the system now, as this text said. Uh, by that, I mean her entire preoccupation was conforming to an orthodoxy at a fundamentalist level. She agrees with these words, but extracted a different meaning from them. Coincidentally, 1977 was during the ascendancy of uh, what became known as the religious right. In the, ter in the 1970s, the term religious right was frequently used as a right of religion, as opposed to right-wing politics, yes. and placed within a broader framework of the civil rights movement. It was a pivot from, from historically existing outside the political system to an exercise in agency and trying to control it. So uh, let's revisit uh, this again, and I'm going to read that passage and put in an interpretation of how Sparks, as representative of the 1970s religious right movement, sees those words now. Uh, this is a script, so I'm gonna, so you have parts that say Larry, I have parts that say Chris, so we're gonna do that. All right, here we go. So, uh, this is the same as before, anti-values. Anti-modern values. We're for establishing our own peer group. Of believers in tradition. Now, realization that violence leads to oppression, the violence of hippies leads to the oppression of the silent majority. In order to unsystematize the system, reorient modern society toward Christian values. You must work from within the system, and you must be open to different points of view. Such as voting for a divorced movie star. Ronald Reagan. Jay's content only exists in these small selected snippets, kind of like islands in the desert of Bee Sparks. The next page... it. it on the next page, it goes back to her pedophile erotica. So here we go. Okay. Today, I met Pete, and there's something really different about him. I feel Pete is drawn to me, as I am to him, but I don't know why. He's a gorgeous, slick, slim, trim jock, and different somehow than the rest of the teachers, but I don't know how he's not some crazy fairy fruit. It's scary, but it's exciting. This isn't the first time B wrote a story about a teenager lusting for a teacher. Last time we talked about a story that she did under an alias, 1949 comic book, Junie, in issue 7, called A Torture Teacher. Same premise. Except here, uh, Pete introduces Jay to, well, let's quote. He talks so easy about uh, intuition, meditation, ESP, or a life after death, the oversoul, how much karma a person must erase before the limited... Uh, liberated, how they can better influence the world in the new age, how they can recognize a soulmate, mysticism, erotic, esoteric science, hidden teachings of the ancients, the equations of life. He says, an Astrian in need never walks alone. Astera is a rather obscure organization that used to advertise in something called Horoscope Magazine in the 1970s. In fact, this entire list could be found in the ads of one 1977 issue I was able to find online. So she was just paging through and said, oh, I'm just going to put this word in, this word in. Anyway, uh, in fact, th th these things come in, in sequential paging order. Uh, anyway, like when she was using the drug term uh, torpedo, Sparks clearly has no concept of what these means but beyond the ad she saw in the magazine. Oh, so remember how we said that all deviations get thrown into a giant grab bag? Yeah. Uh, let's go here. Uh, this is her, his lust for Pete. Uh, later on, Pete was a fruit. But raping a little 10-year-old boy in a broom closet? Man, what kind of weirdo is that? I wonder how long it would have taken before Pete put the moves on me. <laughs> Dave said he got to no, uh, no telling how many kids with promises or bribes or just gentle offers of friendships and acceptance. Lots of kids need that so badly. They would do almost anything to get it from almost anyone. And I thought Pete was so neat. I wonder if he was using PS PCP or something. Again, because Sparks believes the orchestration of things such as drug use or homosexuality is by the same actual horned prince of darkness with a pitchfork and hooves. In her head, these are all track as if they are inedible. You know, and remember yeah. Anita Bryant, right? Yeah. Uh, of the 21 journal entries that Sparks lifted from the actual Jay's journal, none of them were put in, in their entirety. They were all edited and added onto. It's pretty easy to tell what are Beatrice's and which are Jay's. Here's an example. See if you can tell. Uh, the hint is I'm starting with B. It'll switch to J and then back to B. Okay. It's so cozy in here between our rooms. I can hear Kendo and Chad sniffing and snorting and making other sounds. Nice little boy noises. I'm all, I'm all right now, soft and warm and protected. Oh, dear God, I am blessed to be in this family. <laughs> Chicago, coming through it. Coming into it through miles of grain fields and barns like big castles. I thought we had come across a new race of people. In the little towns, they were just like us, complaining about the prices too high and the government too low. But in the city, it's crazy and rough, wind blowing the piercing, 
the buildings piercing through the sky, making their own ragged peaks. I love walking down the wild, windswept lakeshore, fighting to keep each grain of sand and seashell as its own. The birds seem as aggressive as the weather. Maybe next year, Brad and Dell and I can take uh, the car and come back here on our own. Wouldn't it be fun? There's the three of us crossing the nation. It shouldn't cost too much, and we could take our sleeping bags and buy most of our food in the markets. I really had meant to write every day, but at night I'm usually just poop, poop, double poop. Essentially, Jay's writings are imaginative and abstract. They tie in an entire experience. They show some fe uh, feeling distant and isolated from most of society, unable to make a connection that will give him groundings in the terms of engagement he seeks. B's writings is a crude, egotistical, cloying twaddle with f uh, frequent sexual and patronizing descriptions of children. She was a, ta a tacky, foul, and repugnant person. This happens to be the most entertaining kind of person, as long as they don't get too close. Anyway, the drop-off is dramatic. In the next example, we, find, we also find the only chrono chronologically possible reference in the whole text. The event that is being re uh, referred to is from 1969, a few months before the actual authorship of The Real Journal in 1970. Again, let's see if you can tell where B stops, J starts, <laughs> and B starts again. I don't care about teachers or friends or classmates or anything. I want her, want her, want her. Actually, I'm not that depraved, but it's bad, almost worse than before. Our lives have become one giant instead of. Instead of going to assembly, we, we go get it on in my car. I'm beginning to live for my occult experiences that are more fulfilling than life, <laughs> death, drugs, even sex. Tina showed me some material during lunch that she is fragmenting. We're getting there. The Menninger Foundation of Topeka, Kansas, under strict supervision of the Voluntary Controls Program Research Department, had Swami Rami leave his ashram in northern India so they could check his mind, ability, and capacity to regulate his physiological process, especially those the functions usually labeled involuntary automatic. Westerners are enabled by the pursuit of power and riches that they're unaware of the wonders of the unseen and leave unexplored the mysteries and truths around them. Dell and Brad and I are taking off with Mel for Colorado <laughs> again after school. Life was just so yuck. Nothing. Dull. Until this came up. Poor Tina is stuck because she couldn't manipulate her way to come. It must be tough being a girl. <laughs> Did you catch the transition? Yeah. Yep, there's no need for factor. Might as well put B stuff in Comic Sans. Not only is the uh, okay, we got 14 minutes. Not only is the attitude towards the world starkly different, but so is their interpretation. Uh, Jay has a coarse and unrefined view of things, which are more or less on the right dartboard, and you can see that his ideas are kind of broad and not focused like most people as a teenager. He's starting to understand institutions, power dynamics, and their currently configured interplay. Right? Sparks, however, has a very refined and crisp view of the world, which is entirely inaccurate and juvenile, as opposed to trying to unravel the contours and sophistications of human collective, which is what Jay was doing. Uh, Beatrice has a cartoonish view of the world as isolated or transactional engagements between individuals of single units of emotion. I transfer one unit of humility and receive one unit of, of gratitude. This strange mathematical model of society is a very well-defined relationship that only exists in our head. This is why she probably ditched 95% of Alden's actual journal. It doesn't fit within this world. It's weird emotions as a currency in a market model. They probably weren't cheery enough or could have said things that made her feel uncomfortable. And by feeling uncomfortable, I don't mean drugs or sexualizing children. That's the stuff she actually yeah. puts in. No, I mean other stuff. Chapter 35 of Keys to Happiness, called Patriotism. Now, this is what I'm getting at. The last two words of this chapter on patriotism are the Bible. <laughs> now, I've been editing Sparks to make her seem more talented, but let's just do this in full. So this is completely unedited. Time, so you can feel the bee, times have changed. And due to the persistent efforts of one woman, the Supreme Court has taken prayer out of the schoolroom. Many school boards feel that it is unnecessary to say a Pledge of Allegiance every day, and children are no longer taught the songs of America and freedom. The majority of people no longer stand to show... I'm going to read this as is, mm. and there's issues. Let me see. The majority of people no longer stand, show their respect to the flag. The symbol of our country passes by nor do they feel an emotional kinship to it. So that is what she looks like with no editing at all. The publisher didn't even read through That's the book. That's what I said. Yeah. It was just straight to press. For, forget forget fact-checking. They it. didn't even proofread. Yeah. Scott Barrett, Alden's brother, now I'm paraphrasing him, mm. he said that she excluded anything that questions anything, questions mm. patriotism, the war, the church. That's who she was. She omits his essence. Now, now there's a stage direction. you, you got to observe it. Okay. Part 7. What teenagers hide from their parents the most are their passion for Jesus Christ. That's right. To, okay, ten minutes. to uphold a set of beliefs, you have to rationalize away inconsistencies. 
The easiest way to do that is through what could be termed conspiracy brain. For instance, if the belief is spies are following me, the lack of evidence is the evidence of just how secretive they are. The only rule the orthodoxy game plays by is that the beliefs of it are true. Everything else is constructed in service of that rule. That is why signs outside of fundamentalist church say the truth as opposed to the reality. <laughs> reality is subject of evidence, uh, while uh, truth is only a subject of argument. Calling something true is a claim that you lack the capacity to challenge it in a way you consider plausible. Fundamentalists believe that there are two opposing forces that are within every person, that of an anthropomorphized uh, good and evil, and every human manages real relationships with them. That's why fundamentalists insist that what they do is not a religion, but an exercise of the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Beatrice assumes this is how the world works, and this is reality. So when in her fictionalized diary, she invents passages where teenagers are inexplicably struggling with desires of joining a clergy, she sees this as real. <laughs> the reason there is no evidence for this happening is conspiracy brain. Uh, the devil is so victorious that the spirit of the Lord is repressed and hidden away. One can imagine her paging through Alden's real journal, mumbling, why, it's not even in here, things are that bad. <laughs> That's also why fundamentalists are so susceptible to being defrauded and hooked into conspiracy theories. Those things are structured in the same way. Statements that you must fundamentally accept as true in a way that you warp the evidence around it. So back to the text. Uh, like in Go Ask Alice, our protagonist has at some point a deep itching desire to be involved in organized religion, but was unable to pursue it. I don't know. Uh, I guess it really was in some grade when I started getting off track. When I was in first and second and third grade, there's a repetition again. <laughs> I was so religious and everything. I looked forward to being a deacon for as long as I remember. And I've been saving my money to go on a mission since the first, uh, since I knew what money was. Whatever happened to that nice little boy that I would never know again? I feel sad, like someone has died. Maybe a part of me, the good part. Then there's the utterly unbelievable passages that just make me shake my head in disbelief at how transparently bad it is. Okay. I'll quote. Sweet little Chad looked up on at me with his innocent childish eyes, shining after it was over, and asked me seriously if really four true angels were singing with us. That about wipes me out. Wow, a tear just dropped down from a journal, uh, even now. This absurd fable, uh, she repeats in many different ways, and to preface the key of, uh, to happiness on page one, she states this quote, same thing. Stand like a child of God, walk like a child of God, talk and think and act, and, and act exactly who you are from this day forth. The girl seemed too stunned uh, to even answer. And as there were other people in the hall, we both went our separate ways without even saying goodbye. She misspelled goodbye in page one, actually. <laughs> uh, the following day, uh, she was a different girl. Her footsteps were light and her head was high. She looked directly into her eyes and her fear and humi humility were now gentleness and humility. I screw. I didn't notice that mistake. She made that mistake. U unanimously, unanimously, we voted her uh, first attendant, even with this dismally low tally of points from the previous day. Uh, so not only did she misspell that word, but then she changed the fake person's gender. <laughs> um, the end of the preface is this. I forgot to ask her name again. She will forever remain anonymous. Right. No. Except for her old, frightened, lonely cry, which still echoes coldly and darkly in the hearts of so many people. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? I know who you are. And you know who you are. No, you don't. Hmm. Beatrice, you really don't. She really does not. Uh, and according to word calculations, I should basically be at the end of time here, so we'll have to resume this next week. Actually, that was pretty good. Where are we? What time? 53. Oh, what do we usually do? 40? No, about 50. Oh. But hey. Well, we're just a few minutes over. Yeah. Well, some of it is that I had to continue when you were... Um, you had to go on when I... I did. I did leave some of it out. <laughs> you, you were going to mess. But yeah. So um, I guess that uh, next week I'm going to finish. There's two. There's a few other sections. Like I haven't really gotten to the occult. I haven't gotten to um, the drugs. The drugs. Do you think uh, she did any, or she just was? Uh, maybe I, she did some drugs. Maybe that's how she wrote this. Yeah. You know, I kind of think that. Maybe if was, there's no one more against drugs than people that use them. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's like a uh, Rush Limbaugh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. 
rallying against drugs, wanting the, the death penalty for drug dealers and or, turning or, out he was sending his maid out to get uh, hillbilly or heroin the, for him. Or all of the anti-gay politicians. Right, right that get caught in airport pool men's rooms. Yeah. Mm. Or, or what's his name, Jerry Falwell Jr., blowing the pool boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I kind of think that he was just stuck in that situation because, mm. of, you know, he was born into it. Uh, so... I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to read Norman Vincent Peale's book, The, the, <laughs> and the see Power of Positive Things. Yeah, I've, I've got it. So, yes, I think it's going to be a quick read. And, yeah, then we're going to go into Satanist books. Yeah. Whose books? Just the, the fake oh. Satanist books. Oh. I'm picking them up. <coughs> Pro or con? Mm. They're the fake diaries. Oh. By, like, evangelical people. It's weird because the, the only people that really write about Satanists are Christians. Right, right. Because, you know, they're kinky like that. Yeah. Anyway. It's a little bit of a turn on. I know. All uh, right, well, let's go home. Yeah. Damn, Sparks. <laughs>